Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started with the class. For announcements, don't forget you have uh, pre-lab two this week and quiz two due this week. We will finish up the material needed for those assignments today. So you can stop by office hours if you have any questions about those. And uh, don't forget lab one submission is due this week and you will perform lab two this Friday. And for homework, when, when you finally get to the assignments that have book problems, don't forget the seventh edition is the edition to take the, the book problems out of, uh, not the global edition, not the international edition. Those homework problems don't match. Uh, my office hours will be right after class if you have any questions uh, or you just want to stop by to chat or listen in. Uh, also check Slack. Slack has uh, homework assignment cat, uh, channels, uh, quiz channels, uh, lab channels. So if you have any questions in those categories, post those to Slack and I get notifications. And when I can get to those, I do. Um, if you have any questions during class, be sure to chat or unmute and uh, we'll talk about your questions during class. Otherwise, please stay muted to keep the background noise low. So I wanted to go through a preview of lab two. I like to do this when we have time in the class, in the lecture time. So you're going to do resistive circuit analysis. And so this is the circuit you're going to analyze with four resistors and a source that will be created by your power supply in lab and some voltages defined. And you're going to apply and demonstrate Kirchhoff's voltage law and voltage division, which we will cover today. So you're going to do some uh, calculations and measurements and, and really see they match. Uh, and then you'll do the same thing for a parallel set of resistors where you have a source and four resistors. And then uh, you will also demonstrate Kirchhoff's law, but in this case, Kirchhoff's current law and current division. You'll also uh, design a variable voltage source that looks like this. We will talk about the potentiometer today. So if you have any questions about today's material, stop by after class and you have some requirements. So as you turn the knob, you'll see of the potentiometer, your output voltage should change uh, within the, 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 the range described here, okay, from one volt to two volts. And so this is what you have to do. You have to design for your pre-lab the circuit that does this. There is guidance in the pre-lab to walk you through this. Um, and so, again, if you have any questions, stop by after class and I'd be happy to talk about this. Okay. Um, so what we will see today is that, and I just want to point this out early, this will apply to your lab, is that you're going to take that potentiometer device and for analysis purposes, replace it with two resistors. So you're going to see in, in the lab or the pre-lab that you'll have um, for analysis purposes, four resistors here instead of two resistors and a potentiometer. This will make more sense during today's lecture. So let's dive into that. And again, if you have any questions, let's talk about it during office hours and I'll stick around until your questions are exhausted. So last time we covered uh, Ohm's law and series resistors and parallel resistors. So I wanted to continue with resistive circuits and resistive circuit analysis. So we're going to talk about uh, voltage division and current division, which you might have covered before. So this might be a review, but I'd like to, again, go through the derivation of this so you understand why it works and get some practice analyzing circuits. So let's first talk about uh, voltage division. Once I get my arrow here. So voltage division applies to series resistors. So I have three series resistors here. And voltage division describes a way to calculate how voltage divides among resistors, or in other words, splits up among resistors. How does this voltage here across the series resistors split up into V1, V2, and V3. So for example, if you know V1, I'm sorry, if you know V, given V, find V1, voltage division tells you how to do that. 
For parallel resistors, we can apply current division, which is a way to calculate how current divides among parallel resistors or splits up among parallel resistors. So for example, if you know a current I going into this into the top of this parallel set of resistors and coming out the bottom, then find I1 or find I2 or find I3. Okay, so let's take a look at how this works. And we'll start with voltage division. All right. So voltage division, you have three series resistors and we're going to define uh, this voltage V1 here, right? So you, let's say you apply a voltage Vs across these series resistors, let's find V1. And um, we're going to use Ohm's law. So let's define a current that goes through all three of these resistors, that current I goes through all three. So V1, equals I times R1 for this individual resistor here. But also for all of those resistors, right? All of those resistors could combine into one resistance REQ. And then the current in would be V um, divided by REQ as I'm showing right here. And REQ as we talked about last time for series resistors is the sum of the series resistances. Okay, so if I if I combine these two equations together, I get this, right? So I I I, pl I plug in uh, um, I into this up here into the upper equation, and I get this equation here. And this points out a pattern that applies over and over again to voltage division. If you want to find the voltage across resistance R1, which we call V1 here then V1 equals the, the, the voltage across the series set of resistors times this ratio. On top, you put the resistance across which you want to find the voltage, R1, right? Trying, finding V1 across R1. That's what you put in the numerator. In the denominator, you put the sum of the series resistances, okay? So likewise, uh, V2, this voltage here across R2 can be calculated using that same approach. You could go back and derive this again using V2 is equal to I times R2 and right, fill in this other equation for REQ here, but you're going to get this pattern, this equation. V2 is equal to Vs. Vs is the voltage across all of the series resistors, right? Vs here times this ratio on top goes the resistance across which you want to find the voltage, right, R2, in the denominator, the sum of the series resistances, right? I'm sure you get the pattern now. Here's the equation for V3. V3 equals the voltage across the series resistances times this ratio on top, R3, the resistance across which you're trying to find the voltage in the denominator, the sum of the resistances. So if I had four resistors, um, I could calculate V1 through V4. And in the, the denominator, you would have R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4. Okay. Series resistances show up a lot in circuits. And so this is a, a, a quick way, a shortcut way, instead of deriving every time, right, what I do up here, this is a shortcut way for finding the voltage across individual resistors in a series set. So that's how voltage splits up among series resistors. Let's take a look at how current splits up among parallel resistors using current division. So let's suppose I have this current coming in, IS, and again, there's, there's something attached to the left here. You have to assume that current comes from somewhere. So the current comes in from the left, it goes uh, out the bottom here, <clears throat> but Assuming that you have IS coming into this parallel set at the top and you want to find I1, the current through R1. So let's derive the current di uh, division equation to find I1. Well, I can find I1 if I only knew V. Uh, v. So V is the voltage across all of these resistors. 
and the current through R1 would be this, V over R1. Then I can use Ohm's law and say V is equal to IS times REQ. So this is V here. REQ is the parallel combination of all these resistances. So they collapse down into one resistance. That resistance is REQ. So V would equal to be equal to I S times REQ, right? Imagine all these things, all these resistors collapse into one resistance. I combine these equations and I get this. I get uh, uh, V is equal to I S times REQ. And this is this is REQ here. And so then um, now I can I can I can uh, calculate I1. I1 oops, is equal to IS, right, times REQ, which is, well, this without the 1 over R1, the 1 over R1 comes from the Ohm's law equation for I1. That's the derivation. You could calculate that every time, or you can memorize, dare I say, this current division pattern relationship equation here. So here's how I would say this. The current through I uh, through R1, right? Resistor R1, which is I1, the current through R1 is equal to the current coming into the parallel set of resistors, IS, times this ratio. So there are a bunch of inverses in here. On top, you have the reciprocal of the resistance through which you want to find the current divided by the sum of the reciprocals of all the resistances. By the way, here's where conductance might make more sense because this is conductance G1, G1, G2, G3, but I stick with resistances. It just, look, I think it makes it easier, but the equation looks a little more complicated. But if we apply that pattern, let's say to finding I2, the current through the resistor uh, R2, then in the same way, using that same pattern, I2 is equal to IS, the current coming into that parallel set, times this ratio, the reciprocal of the resistance through which you're trying to find the current, divided by the sum of the reciprocals of all the resistances. All right, so you could use that to find I3 also. So I3 is the current coming into the parallel set times the ratio of, on top, the reciprocal of the resistance through which you're trying to find the current, divided by the sum of the reciprocals. If you had a fourth resistor hanging out here, then you'd have a, a plus one over R4 in the denominator. All right. Any questions on voltage division or current division uh, at this point? Okay, nothing heard, nothing seen in the chat. So we'll continue on. And again, if you want to dig into this more, stop by office hours, we will hit the whiteboard. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about a new circuit element called a potentiometer. This is what you need for your lab and for your, uh, your quiz. So a potentiometer is a special type of resistor. A potentiometer, or sometimes called a pot, is a three-terminal adjustable resistor. Some examples of what they look like physically are these. Right, here is the one you have in your electronics kit. Here's the bottom of that. It has three pins, three terminals. Here's a, a multi-turn potentiometer. Here's another style of potentiometer that where you can turn the screw. This is the, the screw right here that, that adjusts the resistance. Okay, this right here is the knob on top. You can turn that without a screwdriver in, on, on your potentiometer. Here's one that looks sort of like a volume knob. It has a knurled shaft on it, so you could put a knob on it. So this is sort of like an adjustable potentiometer that might be a volume knob in, in some device. The schematic symbol looks like this. It is a three terminal device. So I've labeled them here, A, B, and W. They might be labeled terminals one, two, three, A, B, C, whatever, but here I've labeled them A, B, and W. 
a potentiometer typically has a resistance value. Even though it's a variable resistor, I'll show you why, it has a single resistance value. And here's what that resistance value specifies. Imagine this, this is a cartoon of what happens inside of a potentiometer. Imagine you have three terminals and terminals A and B are connected to resistive material where my mouse pointer is going around, right? So that gray area is resistive material. So forget about terminal W for a second, don't connect it to anything. Between terminals A and B, you would have RP ohms. So if this is a 10 kilo ohm, 10,000 ohm potentiometer, there would be 10,000 ohms of resistive material. So if you took an ohm meter measured between A and B, you would measure 10,000 ohms. Then enter terminal W here, which is connected to this, what's called a, a wiper. This wiper turns. So as you turn this knob or this screw here, you, this wiper rotates around the center, right where my mouse is. And so that contact point where the wiper meets the resistive material, it can run, can be moved to any position along that resistive material. The wiper is a conductor, it's metal. It's a it's a, assume it's a perfect conductor. So this resistive material uh, is laid out on this device such that, let's say the resistance is proportional to the length along that arc. So uh, if I have, if I measure resistance between 10% of the arc, I'll only have 10% of the resistance value. If I measure along the whole arc and I get 10K ohms, if I measure along half the arc, I get 5k ohms. If I measure along 5% of the arc, I get 500 ohms. Okay, so resistance is proportional to the length of the resistance, resistive material that we're using here. Let's, so let's go ahead. Is the resistance adjustable from zero all the way up to the specified value? It is. In fact, between, and we'll take a look at this, but, but if you just look at terminals A and W, for example, forget about B, just don't connect it to anything. Then as you, as you turn the potentiometer knob or screw, you could adjust the resistance between A and W between zero and RP. That's right. The way we could express that, well, is, is like this. Let's say we have a 10K ohm potentiometer. Here's the cartoon redrawn. Um, here's the schematic symbol just with a value. You can envision the resistive material between A and W as being one resistor and between W and B as being a second resistor. Okay, so that would look like this. So between A and W is resistor R1, right? This resistance here in this wiper position. R2 between W and B is this resistance right here. So that's going to adjust, right? As you turn the knob, R1 and R2 change. One thing that always happens though is uh, R1 plus R2 always equals RP. So the whole length of this resistive material, let's say it's 10K ohms, then if R1 is 4K ohms, then R2 must be 6K ohms. They always have to add to the total resistance of the potentiometer just because physically the way it's laid out there. Now, to make this mathematic so that we can write some equations or algebraic, um, I'm going to define T to be the fraction of the full turn range, zero to one. So here, if I turn the wiper all the way to the left, we'll call that T equals zero. It's just a parameter that describes the fraction of the turn range. If I turn the wiper to one third of the full range, then let's call that T equals one third halfway t equals one half. And if I turn the wiper all the way to the right so that it's touching the B terminal, that's t equals one. This is not universal. Turning all the way to the left is not always t equals zero. It might be turn all the way to the right and that's t equals zero. So it depends on the potentiometer. I'm just using this here as an example and showing that you can parameterize the, the turn percentage as t so that we can write some equations. Okay, so if I have, um, you know, the, the wiper here, let's say that's one third of the way around, then a third of the resistance is between A and, between A and W. So you know it'd be like 3.33K, right? And the rest of the resistance between B and W 
is 6.667k. Um, to write that equation, we could do this. This is how you write an equation for R1. That would be 10k times what? One third at this position, right? And that's for R1. And R2 would be 10k times two thirds, which is one minus one third. Okay, that's where this comes from. So I think actually looking at it and understanding it's easier than understanding the equations, but we want to represent the value with equations here. Let's do a table, let's create a table. Here's the fraction of the turn. So resistance R1 would be zero because W would be connected directly to terminal A and the rest of the resistive material would be between W and B. So R1 would be zero, R2 would be 10K if I turn the potentiometer to one third, I'd have, as I mentioned, 3.3K for R1, 6.6K for R2. Halfway, both resistances would be the same. Turn the knob all the way to the right in this drawing, and I would have all the resistive material between A and W, so you'd get 10K for R1, 0K for R2, okay? So that is, that's a potentiometer. Um, that's how it works. We'll talk a little bit on the next slide about how to apply this to a variable voltage reference um, and, and, and application of this. So someone asked on, on the chat, why is terminal B needed if W just completes the circuit right at that end anyway, right? So, so first you're assuming that the user is going to adjust this. So, um, you know, the, if if the if W is turned to the full resistance value, um, you don't know it's always going to be that case. There are some cases where you don't need to use all three terminals. If you just need a variable resistor, one way to make a variable resistor, there's a different way in your quiz. You're going to take a look at that. One way is to just use terminals A and W, and as you turn the knob, the resistance changes between A and W, and that works just fine. Um, three terminals are needed for what I'm going to show you on the next slide. So if you want to create a variable voltage reference, for example, uh, you can do that with a voltage divider that is adjustable. So let's create an adjustable voltage reference using a potentiometer as a voltage divider. So here is where, so I'm go going to use all three terminals here. I need all three terminals here. I've taken a 12 volt voltage source I've applied it to the end terminals of the potentiometer, and I'm going to call the output voltage that I want to create the voltage between the wiper and the bottom terminal of the potentiometer here. Now remember, and this is what I said, right, as a preview during your, during your lab preview, that you're going to split this potentiometer up into two resistances, just like I did on the last slide. So he, here I've done that. So these two resistances here are, are really the resistances internal to that potentiometer. For analysis purposes, we can, we can do this. Okay, so this is an equivalent circuit diagram. Now, let's apply voltage division. I have a voltage of 12 volts applied VS applied across the series set of series pair of R1 and R2. If there's nothing connected to V out or otherwise, if there's very little current coming out of this terminal here and into the bottom, I can assume these resistances are in series, right? R, any, any current that flows through R1 also flows through R2. In this diagram, those resistances are in series. So I can use voltage division to calculate the voltage across one of those series resistors, R2. So that equation would be this, right? It's going to be the voltage across the series pair times on top of that fraction, R2, that's the resistance across which I'm trying to find the voltage, divided by the sum of the resistances. So I get that here. So here that is. The voltage across R2, which I've called V out, is equal to Vs, the voltage across the series resistors, times the ratio of on top the resistance across which I'm trying to find the voltage divided by the sum of the series resistors. 
Okay, so it may not be obvious here that 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 I've created a an adjustable voltage here, but consider what we talked about on the last slide. R1 and R2 both range from zero to RP. Okay. And R1 plus R2 equals RP. Right. So this the bottom here, this R1 plus R2, that is a constant. That is RP. Right? That's what this is. And on top, R2 is a resistance that changes from zero to RP. Call it 10K, zero to 10K. So this fraction here, R2 over R1 plus R2, that fraction right there varies between zero and one. Okay. So you're multiplying a fraction. As you turn the knob, you can change that fraction from zero to one times Vs. That gives you a range of zero to Vs at the output. So as you turn the potentiometer knob over the full range, V out ranges from zero to Vs. Okay. So that is, this is a way to make a variable voltage source that ranges from zero up to the highest value of the uh, of, of the voltage source attached to the series resistors here or the potentiometer. So a couple notes here. First, if you connect, let's say another resistor here, you, you know, that resistor would represent something, a light bulb, a motor, an LED, you know, so, some kind of circuit that lights up maybe. As soon as you start taking current from this terminal, these resistors are no longer in series, okay? So if you analyze it, this variable adjustable voltage source uh, at V out uh, won't linearly range from zero to 12. It still will range from zero to 12, but it won't be very linear. It won't work all that well if you have a lot of current coming out of here. But my purpose here is this, just to show you if you have, if you need a voltage and you will for your lab 10, if you need a voltage that varies, you can use a potentiometer to have that manually controlled with a knob, have that voltage manually controlled. You can also use these resistances as um, uh, potentiometers as, for example, uh, the volume knob for, for an amplifier. We're going to get to op amps. We haven't talked about those yet. But if you could adjust, so resistances set the gain of an op amp circuit. We're going to see that. If you could vary that resistance, now you can vary the gain. The gain is just a multiplier that you multiply by an input signal. So now you could have an amplifier with a variable gain, which is a volume knob, if it's an audio amplifier. So lots of things you can do with potentiometers. Um, many of the knobs that you see in devices, if there's a mechanical knob, use potentiometers. There are other devices, they're optical encoders, things like that, but this is one way to have an adjustable user interface that's a mechanical knob, okay? In your lab, you're going to take a resistor and put it right where my mouse is here and a resistor and take it put right where my mouse is there. In other words, you're going to have four resistors in this diagram here. And so the reason for that is instead of going from uh, having a range from zero to the maximum, you want to compress that range. So as you, as you turn the knob the full direction, all the way left, all the way right, the voltage is going to change between one volt and two volts instead of zero volts to five volts or whatever the specified values are. So take a look at that. That is described in the pre-lab and it will apply voltage division and this potentiometer concept. Okay. Any questions on the potentiometer at this point? Okay, again, stop by office hours and as things sink in, we can discuss those also. So let's try, uh, let's do a clicker question then. So break out your clicker app. And let's try an Ohm's law problem.
So we have a circuit with circuit element A. You don't know what it is. Could be a sub-circuit, but you do know that current IA goes through element A in that direction shown, and you have a resistor, and voltage VY is given to you. The polarity is defined. So what is VY? Find VY. So take a minute and solve for that. And this is where I mentioned, be careful with, be careful with the signs, right? You have to draw the reference direction of the current for Ohm's law into one of the polarities, one of the polarity markings, I should say. All right, take. I don't know, 15 more seconds. Take a guess if you haven't finished. And we'll talk about the solution. Okay. All right, so I, I have four amps in the direction shown and that arrow is pointing into the negative side of VY. I really want an arrow that points into the positive side of VY. So I need to have this arrow here. Or I could flip VY. I could flip the polarity of the voltage and call it negative VY. Either way will work, but I chose to flip the current direction here. So instead of four amps into the negative side, I have negative four amps going into the positive side. Okay, and so now I can apply Ohm's law of Vy equals I times R with I and R as shown, and I get negative 48 volts. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Then let's, let's move on. So depending upon what physics class you took and maybe what maybe you took another intro circuits class or maybe you saw this in some kind of engineering intro class depending upon what class you took that may have been review up until this point right so ohm's law kcl kvl maybe voltage division current division so now um, what i'm going to do is step into some new material up until this point i've been using a lot of slides um, as we get into this newer material, I'll start using the whiteboard and working problems at a reasonable speed uh, by hand. So I'll do a mixture of slides, usually slides to explain the concept and then examples on the whiteboard. So we're going to start a topic called node voltage analysis. Once I get my screen straight here. Okay, so let's talk about node voltage analysis. To talk about node voltage analysis, we have to talk about node voltages. So we, I will define node voltages and then we will use those node voltages in a process to analyze a circuit. Okay, so a node voltage, this is what it is. A node voltage is the voltage between a node and a reference node. Remember voltages are always defined, measured, specified between two separate nodes, right? A, a, a voltage between a node and itself is always zero, but any non-zero voltage is always between one node and another node, okay? So these two nodes def that define a node voltage is, is some node that we're going to pick, and then what we're going to define to be a reference node. That reference node is the negative side of the polarity for every node voltage defined in the circuit. This reference node is often referred to as ground. Okay, so if you're used to working with circuits with a common ground, then every voltage you're measuring with reference to ground is a node voltage. So let me draw some diagrams here. 
So here is a circuit. The circuit has resistances and a current source. Um, I'm going to define, uh, define which node is the reference node. All right, so these are typical reference node symbols. You know them as ground symbols outside of a circuits class. So these are all ground symbols. If you see any one of these symbols, and there actually are a few others like a, like a triangle instead of this lined triangle here, that means when you, when you attach that, you draw that next to a node like right here, that means I've defined that node to be the reference node for all node voltages in the circuit. That's what I'm calling uh, ground. And remember, a node is the entire connection between circuit elements. So this ground node now is everything circled in blue. All right, okay. I could define a node voltage V1 without any polarity. Right? You just take a voltage variable and you write it next to a node. And that applies to this pinkish node here, okay? So V1 is the voltage, is the node voltage at this node. But what does that really mean? You can't have a voltage at a single node. A voltage is between two nodes. Well, the voltage V1 is between that node next to V1 and the reference node, ground. So the voltage between pink and blue here is V1. If I took a voltmeter and put the positive terminal, positive lead anywhere on the pink node and anywhere, the negative terminal anywhere on the blue node, I would measure V1, which happens to be across that resistor also. Okay, I could define node voltage V2. I just write that variable next to a node that applies to the entire connection between the circuit elements. And then V2 would be the voltage between that brown node and ground. That's, that's how positive and negative would be defined. The positive is always at the node where you've written the node voltage, right? The positive reference polarity is always there. And the negative reference polarity for that variable is always at ground. That's how we've defined it. I could write V3 next to the upper right node here, which applies to this whole purple node. And then V3 would between, be between that purple node and the blue node. The negative sign for node voltage is when you do write the polarities, if you do the write, the, write the polarities, the negative sign is always at ground. And the positive sign is wherever you've defined the node voltage. Okay, so think of it this way. The reference node is where you would connect the black lead, the negative lead of your voltmeter. Okay. And the non-reference node, or the, where the node voltage is, is where you connect the red lead of your voltmeter. So if I wanted to um, um, measure a node voltage, this is how I would connect my leads. So the node voltage is the voltage between those two nodes. Okay, so if I want to measure V1, I do this. Put a voltmeter there, connect it between these two nodes. If I want to measure V2, I do that. And if I want to measure V3, I do that. So that is just a node voltage definition. We haven't analyzed anything yet, but we need to understand this definition to do node voltage analysis. Okay. Are there any questions on that concept of node voltages before we go on? All right. So let's talk about, well, why did I put the reference node at the bottom here? Do I always have to put it at the bottom? The answer is no. And what happens if I move the reference node or, you know, what if I want to use a reference node and none is given for me? Well, the answer to that is if you're given a reference node, use it, don't, don't move it. If you're not given a reference node, you can actually assign it anywhere you want because that's just where you're going to put the negative lead of your voltmeter for measuring throughout the circuit. So we talked about this circuit here where the ground, the reference node was at the bottom. Um, if I draw that circuit again and I put the reference node at the upper right, that's okay, right? If I want, if I have some reason to do that, that's fine. That's just where I'm going to define the negative side of all of my uh, node voltages. And then I could now, now I've, I've totally changed where I've defined node voltages 
in the circuit now because um, I moved the ground node. But let's say V1 is in the upper left node, which applies to that whole node, remember? Then V1 would be the voltage between this upper left node, the pink node, and the purple node, as shown here. Remember the, remember the negative sign always goes at the ground node for the reference polarity, and the positive sign goes at the node wherever you drew the node voltage. If I say V2 is the center node, then uh, this is V2 here. I say V3 is this bottom node, the only node remaining that's undefined. Uh, then V3 is this voltage here. The positive always goes where I wrote the, the node voltage, the negative goes at ground. And even though I've used like V1, V2, V3, and, I, and now I've primed these, right? I put primes next to these variables because the V1 on the left is not the same as the V1 on the right, right? So, so Uh, these are these are different values because they're measured between different points in the circuit. Someone said, "How can you have the current going into ground?" That's oh, that's just fine. We we can. Um, so what happens here is remember the ground symbol doesn't actually do anything in the circuit other than define where you're referencing your voltages. Okay, so I put this ground symbol in the upper right. If I take that ground symbol out, it doesn't change anything about the circuit, except I can't define node voltages anymore. I need a ground symbol to define node voltages. So in this circuit, if, if this is a positive current going through this um, supply here, right? I'd have maybe three amps. Three amps comes down here, three amps goes this way, three amps splits goes through this resistor and it goes through this resistor. It circulates around and then three amps comes back up here, right? So the three amps comes out, it splits, it goes around the circuit and then three amps comes back into the source here. If I have that ground there or not, that doesn't change anything about the circuit. It's just a definition of where I'm putting the negative lead of my voltmeter if I wanted to measure node voltages, okay? So, uh, when we have multiple grounds in a circuit, ground symbols in a circuit, we'll talk about that later, you assume that all the ground nodes are connected together with wires. Let's, let's leave that for later. But in this circuit, the ground, there's no problem with current flowing into this node and then out of this node through these two resistors here. Okay. So adding a reference node does not actually change the circuit. It only indicates a reference node for measuring voltages or defining voltages, analyzing voltages, right? And changing the reference node does not change the voltage across circuit elements. It only changes the reference point for measuring node voltages or defining node voltages. So when I moved, you know, with a with a single ground in a circuit, a single ground symbol, when I moved this ground node from the bottom to the upper right, it didn't change anything, forget about the node voltages, it didn't change anything about the circuits, voltages, currents, and powers for each of the reference elements or circuit elements, okay? For example, uh, this, you know, if I move the ground node, I still have, let's say, three amps flowing through this branch and through this branch because of the current source. The voltage across this resistor here is the same as the voltage across the resistor on the left. Right, the current through this resistor right here is the same as this current over here. It's like it's like instead of instead of putting my voltmeter in the circuit, I you know connecting the black lead to the circuit. I just I just disconnected it. I just disconnected my my voltmeter, but the circuit's still operating the same way. That ground node symbol only indicates the negative side of any current, or the negative side of any voltage that you would be measuring or defining. Okay. So that's, that's important. We'll work with that. I think you'll see that as you work some problems. Okay. Any other questions on this concept of a node voltage and the reference node? Okay, so here, here's my example. Here's another example to help, help talk about this. Um, I have a marker. Um, so I have a red and a black marker, right? How, what's the altitude of this red marker, right? Well, the altitude of this red marker 
has to be defined with respect to some reference altitude. Okay. <clears throat> Many times we'll use mean sea level, MSL, mean sea, mean sea level as a reference. So, so this marker is about 50, 100 feet above mean sea level right now. Okay. Or I could say above ground level, AGL. That's another reference point. How high above ground? This is, you know, five feet above ground level. So, so the altitude of the height, right? The altitude of this marker depends on the reference used to define it. So, so I can have, you know, I can have the um, red marker reference to this black marker, one foot, or I could have the red marker again reference to the black marker, negative one foot. So, so I'm not moving the position of the red marker. I'm just changing the altitude reference plane, the, the, the reference position against which I'm comparing the height. Okay, so just like voltage, just like altitude or height needs two points to measure, so does voltage. All the ground symbol says is that's my reference right there, right? So, all right. So let's talk about calculating other circuit var variables using node voltages. So I'm going to go down this path here where I'm going to do two things. Once you, uh, as I say here, after solving for node voltages throughout a circuit, you are only one or two steps away from all other circuit variables, right? Once you have all the voltages, you can calculate powers and currents. That's one reason I want to show you this. The other reason is this is going to be a step in the process of what we're going to call node voltage analysis. So let's take the circuit. Let's define, uh, let's call this resistor R1 here. Let's call this um, node voltage V1, where this is ground at the bottom. I've, I've defined that. V2 is the voltage node voltage of the center node here. Okay. And I'll define, a voltage and a current I'm going to call Vx and Ix. And let's suppose I want to find Ix and I want to find Vx maybe as an intermediate step. So once I have V1 and V2, I know their values. I'm going to show you that I can calculate Ix and Vx really easily. Let's break this out of the diagram a little bit. And so this is still connected in the circuit, but I want to focus on this resistor and the ground node. Okay, so here are the two volt, here are the two variables, the voltage and the current. Let's figure out what Vx is. Now, if I write the polarities for V1 and V2, these are the polarities and the two points between which those are defined. Right, here's V1, here's V2. I can write a KVL equation to find Vx. Let's say I know V1, I know V2, I want to find Vx. I could say we'll start here, minus V1 plus Vx plus V2 equals zero, and I can write that KVL equation. So knowing V1 and V2, I can find Vx. And knowing Vx and using Ohm's law, I can find um, Ix, and I can replace Vx with V1 minus V2, and I get this. This is going to be an important equation. Next time we will use this, I'll remind you of this, but here's the pattern here that you'll see. The current going from V1 to V2, or right, node one to node two, through resistor R1 is V1 minus V2 over R1. That pattern's gonna show up over and over again, okay? Now I can define a variable, let's say, Vy with the opposite polarity here and to find Iy going the opposite direction. Just to work this out with the opposite uh, reference polarity and the reference direction uh, going the other way. I can break this part of the circuit out, assume it's connected still, but I just want to concentrate on this. I write in my variables. I define V1 and V2 just as I did in the upper right here. And I can write a KVL equation to find Vy. 
right? So minus V1 minus Vy plus V2 equals zero. There's my KVL, I can solve for Vy. So if I know, again, if I know V1 and V2 and I have Vy defined, I can find it. Using Ohm's law, I can find Iy, right? And I can substitute in V2 minus V1 for Vy and I get this. So the big takeaway here is this, uh, for current, for finding current, we're going to use this. If I want the current going from, I'll call it V1 to V2 through a resistor, that current is V1 minus V2 over R1. If I want the current going from V2 to V1 through that resistor, then the equation is V2 minus V1 over R1. Now I have currents pointed in the opposite direction. How could that be? Well, one is the negative of the other, right? We already know that if you'd switch the reference direction, you just write a negative sign and Ix equals negative Iy. So that works out. To finish my point here, when we know node voltages, V1 and V2, we can solve for the currents. We could solve for voltages that aren't node voltages, right? This Vx is not a node voltage. It's not between a node and a reference node, but we could solve for it using node voltages. And we can also solve for power. So if I know Ix and I know Vx, I can solve for power. So like I said, you're always, once you know all the node voltages, you're like one or two steps away from knowing every other value for every other circuit variable, okay? All right, so I'm gonna quit here. Uh, I've hit the wall on time, passed it by a minute. So, so let's end here. Um, so uh, in closing, don't forget pre-lab two is due, quizzes, quiz two is due this week. Stop by office hours if you have any questions. Um, lab one submission is also due. Homework is out of seventh edition. I'll stop saying that soon, but I just want to make sure everybody knows that. Um, join the Slack page if you haven't yet. You can ask questions about the more complicated homework problems as we get there. I hope everything's working out well. If anything isn't, please let me know. I'll start office hours in just a few seconds. So if you'd like to stick around, please do. If not, I will see you next time. Have a great night.